Good afternoon, everybody. This is Fred Nauer, Chief Flight Instructor for Thunderbird Aviation. We have Paul Block here in the picture, our uh, Director of Maintenance here at Thunderbird Aviation. He's going to be talking this afternoon about the uh, Piper Wing AD that has come out and our experience so far with all our wings. Take it away, Paul. Hi, everybody. Uh, if you haven't joined before, uh, we've been doing these uh, maintenance seminars. Now we just added on to the FAA Wings program. Um, but I've been doing these for probably about uh, two, three years. Uh, and we talk about a lot of stuff, preventative maintenance, uh, showing how to do oil changes, different things. But uh, this one, since the AD came out, you see a lot of stuff on the internet. And a lot of Piper people are, are uh, have been getting nervous about this for the last three years since the uh, since the uh, Embry Riddle um, arrow uh, wing separation. So I'm going to give just a little brief introduction to what's been happening with wings on the Pipers, how this all started. Uh, first of all, we're just going to look at this. Uh, here's the AD currently that's out on this. It's AD 2020-20-16. I just thought just for, you know, people don't know, well, what does that mean? Well, you kind of guess that if you see this, that is correct. That's the year comes out. The next dash, you have this number. Uh, they break down ADs. Uh, there's other ways of doing it, but general ADs, there's emergency ones, they come up a little bit differently. But this is the bi-weekly. So they came up with this at the end of 2020, the bi-weekly is 20. And then how many in that two, two week period, uh, there was, this was the 16th numeric one on that. So that just kind of shows us what it is where we're talking about the uh, AD 2020, uh, 16. Uh, just erase this and we'll be using this for some other things here, but how it started, 1980, let me get my notes here, 1987, March 30th, uh, an airplane, PA 28, 181, so it's an archer. Uh, November 8191 Victor, uh, left wing separated. And what they found is the wing separation was at the spar and the interior bolts, uh, hole, or the, would be the exterior bolt holes, the furthest towards the outboard of the wing. Um, uh, and Thank then, you. Again, then again, in November, uh, um, it looks like, I don't know what month it was, but in uh, 1993, uh, there was another airplane, November 2093 Alpha. Uh, this one was a gentleman who got himself into uh, IMC conditions and was a VFR pilot, heavily stressed the PA-28. There again, it was a PA-28-181, an archer, um, highly stressed the wing, and there was a wing separation on that. Upon an investigation, they said, they found a little crack in that same area on the, and I'll show you later, the outboard bolt holes on the lower spar cap. Um, however, on that one, they go, the stress loads that they saw on that wing, they don't think it would have survived um, those stress loads, even if there wasn't a little crack in there. But however, they did determine that there was a little crack starting in the bolt hole region on that. Then we go to 2018, November 106 ER, um, and that is uh, the Embry-Riddle uh, PA-28R uh, 201, and that was the left wing that separated on that, and they found uh, stress fracture cracks at those bolt holes. So this has been going on since 1987. Uh, now on a on a good note, only three Piper wings have fallen off in, in several decades. That's a good that's a good note. So there's a lot of operational hours. However, we don't like seeing wings fall off and uh, we, we need to figure out what's going on. It. So back in 87, after that, um, uh, that wing separation, uh, Piper came out with a, a service bulletin that talked about, this was in June 8th of 1988, the service bulletin, I'll just put it up on the board if anybody so you can see it behind me. Uh, service board then, eight, six, six. Okay. And basically in this service board, they're taking a look at what, how's the usage of an airplane uh, being 
uh, done? You know, what, how, how is it being flown? So basically it went through and the affected models there were, were any, anywhere from a PA-28-140. Um, and, and you gotta remember, they're different wings. So the, anytime we call it a dash zero wing, that's the Hershey bar wing. Uh, dash one wing um, is, is the, the taper wing. So as you see, this is a 201 wing because it's, uh, it has the, the, the dual taper. It tapers both narrowing um, this way, um, horizontally and in thickness too. And so that's the designation. I, I know when they went from the, the Arrow 200, everybody goes, oh, well, it's a 201. It must have more horsepower. I can get my, uh, my uh, high performance out of that. No, you can't. It, it's, it's, it's the dash one wing. It's just the difference in the wing. Um, so if you look at, at, at 1986, everything from PA-28 uh, 140s, to um, uh, the Warrior, the 151. So you had the Hershey bar wing, you had the dash two or dash one wing, the, the uh, Archer wing, which is basically, they're built the same. They are generally speaking now the same wing. You'll see a lot of times uh, pencil marked in there, 161 one slash 181 wing uh, from Piper. Uh, uh, when they build them, they build the same, it's the same wing. It's just, you know, going on the different model number airplane. And then all the way down to the uh, 200 Arrow, which is the Arrow 2, then the Arrow 3, which is the 201, and then uh, the Arrow 4, which is the uh, RT, the T-tail 201. Um, and then they had the Cherokee 235, the, the Cherokee PA32-260, and the 300. So in that time, they decided those, and there were serial number ranges in there too, they, they said, um, these are what we're considering the affected, um, uh, the affected wings in the service bulletin. It was a mandatory service bulletin. Basically, what you were doing is you were inspecting your usage. So on that, they said, okay, let's take a look here. Normal usage, classification A. And this would be, uh, you know, which there's not an extreme, extreme usage. It would be everybody from, from a flight school training in it to just the, the recreational flyer flying his airplane. So that would be classification A. Then they had B, which would be engage, in, engaged in, in um, contour terrain operations. So you'd think um, people looking the fish and game, uh, spotting aerial application, if they were putting anything down, um, you know, spraying, anything like that. Uh, livestock management, where you're flying over the livestock, looking at that, uh, pipeline inspections, Anything where you're kind of flying low and moving around, maybe you got your flaps down. And they called that classification B. Then they had C and D. And, it, and you can look these up later. I'm not going to go through all of them. What I'm going to show you is what we did with classification A. Classification A, we basically took the, um, the hours in service and said, okay, if you're in classification A, you're going to take those hours in service, and then you were going to divide those by 17. So, um, and then that, when you achieved a, a factored wing service hour, then we do the inspection. And a lot of times in this, it was, you know, 30,000, 60,000 hours of flying in classification A. So most of the people would be putting those uh, numbers in. They go, well, I you know, I don't have to do anything. I did this, you know, mandatorily. I, I don't have to do anything with this because I'm flying in classification A. People in B is a little bit more strict. And you can see, I, I, will, uh, I will read off just classification usage. Um, so basically, if you were in classification A, 62,900 hours total time in service would be your initial inspection. And then after 62,900 hours, every 6,000 hours in time to do the inspection. And then the inspection, uh, you know, they go into the criteria of inspecting maybe some of these bolt holes or some of the things in the spar area. So as you see, uh, you know, Piper built these airplanes really strong and uh, we don't like wings falling off, but we also have to figure out why they were built this way. They figured this service bolt was gonna cover it. Well, and then lo and behold, another wing falls off in 93. 
but it was in a heavily stressed situation. Um, uh, IMC, and they said, even if there wasn't a crack in there, that wing would have ripped off. However, upon investigation, there was a little crack. So that comes up with another problem. So what do we do then? Then at that point, we come up after that, um, they, they made uh, more strict um, guidelines on some of the airplanes. And they just kind of looked at more service bulletins of maybe earlier inspection. But at that point, there wasn't anything, no AB had come out, but two airplanes had issues. Lo and behold, 2018, an arrow separates the wind. And we look at um, uh, these uh, situations, it was very, very public because here's now it's the flight game situation. And it's a lot. Wow, I don't know if I don't even remember 1986 uh, uh, accident or the 1993 accident. Um, I just being in aviation, I had been aware of it because of these service bulletins. But um, so basically, what's going on? You know, what's happening here? Why are these wings breaking off? Is there something that uh, we need to investigate more? Um, is it metallurgy? Is it is it a design flaw? Is it bad usage? Um, and so the FAA and the NTSB and Piper and everybody's been working for this last uh, basically uh, you know close to three years now on on what where do we go from here? What do we do next? Because uh, you know might have a problem on some of these airplanes. Uh, if we look at the statistics on on Embry Riddle's plane, they have telemetry on board, so they count more than just hours on an airplane. That had just shy of 7,700 hours, which is not a whole lot. Um, a lot of our planes have more than that. A lot of people, I mean, there's these, these airplanes, as you see, 62,900 hours um, is what Piper's saying here. They've, they've stressed these wings. They think these wings could last and these airplanes last that long. Um, um, and I don't think I've ever, you know, I don't know what the highest one out there is, but these things are very robust, built very well. However, that Embry Riddle, relatively low time for a training airplane, 7,700 hours and relatively new, only 10 years old. So you wouldn't, don't expect, you know, metal corrosion fatigue, anything like that. It is an assault environment there, but, um, you know, that, you know, that might play a, a factor there. I don't know. But if you look at the NTSB report, um, they think it's fatigue due to low level operations and numbers of takeoff and landings. Um, because they had telemetry on board, they had kind of uh, every riddle runs a little black box. They came up with 33,276 takeoffs and landings operations on that uh, aircraft in 10 years. Um, that's a lot. We're playing only on 7,700 hours. And take a look at that. That's more than, uh, I think that's more than four an hour. Do the numbers. 70, it was 70, a little between 7,500 and 7,700, 76, something like that. So do the math. That's relatively speaking, every 15 minutes that airplane was flying, it was doing a, a landing and a takeoff. Um, and they, they feel that metal fatigue. Um, cause that fracture. Um, so let me show you these things and what this AD is about, what we're looking at. So we got three failures in uh, how many decades? Uh, four decades, uh, basically. Um, and uh, we need to we need to investigate. I mean, it's it's a good idea to. We don't. I, I personally, I fly a, a warrior. I don't want the wing falling off. That would be a bad day. Uh, so what they decided is they said, okay, this is where we think the, the uh, original um, cracking is occurring at these bolt holes here. If you look, this is the wing going this direction. These are the last two bottom. I have this upside down. You see the landing gear well here, the spar cap. You have eight, uh, 10 bolts in the bottom, eight bolts on the top. 
And then you have, look back here, Fred, there's 20 bolts holding the swing on. There's a rear attach point, and there's a forward attach point. That's a lot of bolts. Uh, that's very robust. They all slide into this unit, which is taken out of the fuselage, but if you see how your bottom of your fuselage is, these are your hat, hat rails that support the floor. This is the, uh, the, uh, the spar box and carry through box that basically is mated together like this. That's a tight fit, so you gotta, so you gotta, gotta work them in there. It's the other thing, I don't think so, just help you there. Tight fit, you kind of wake them into place and that's how they're mated. Then from there. So the carry through box is part that goes through the fuselage. Yeah, it's at, that's, that's in the fuselage. So this is when, think about it this way, if you rotate this upside down and you're sitting in the back seat and the front part of the seat is sitting on this top portion, that's that beam that goes through there. We're looking at the bottom portion. This is the bottom skin. These are the hat rails that support the floor in your Piper because um, as uh, I've seen, some people think they're Cessna's and they go, I'm gonna get that carpet that keeps on sliding on me. I'm gonna put a screw through there. Well, your floor on a Piper is your outside skin. <laughs> and you'll see a screw going through down there unless you were to carefully get it in this hat section. So these hat sections are your support and they're outside the fuselage. These, we kind of call them if you, if you ended up belly flopping on, a, on, a, on an arrow, the kind of skid plates, you know, they protect everything. But anyways, that's, that's the structure. So if you own a Piper, don't screw your carpet down. Uh, with uh, sheet, uh, sheet metal screws because you'll go through and you'll see a screw down to the other end. Your floor is outside skin. So anyways, that's the box beam. It's right in the front portion of the back seat, right behind the seats. Uh, your legs kind of curve down back here. And this is, this is basically what the front half of the seat sits on in the, in the rear. This is the bottom portion. This is we're looking up. We'd be underneath the belly right now. And we'd have uh, 10 bolts poking through protruding. I'll get a bolt. I don't know if I can squeeze in or it's kind of a tight fit with my hand, but here is one of the NAS uh, close tolerance bolts. That's, that's one of the, one of the um, 18 bolts that, that go in the main box area. And then you have different bolts in the front and the other two attachment spots, but that will be slid through. Let's see if it's close tolerance, so I don't think I'll be able to pull it through there very, very well. But that I'll show you later when I pull the box beam off. That's coming through this way, and then you have a washer on there, and then a nut, and and they're torqued. So what we do on the inspection is, if the wing is still installed, we take the nuts off, push the bolts back through here, and then we clean up this bore area, and then they do what's called an eddy current inspection. So these these areas so now what you're going through on the eddy current is even though you're looking at the spar you're going through the bottom of the box beam which is probably about oh, i don't know a three eighths inch of a metal um we could probably pull this off and see if we could see that um, uh let's look at the cap here fred if you can see this is the same the top portion that's a pretty beefy piece of metal both sides have about the same so if you're looking at this this thickness there. So we're going through that on the bottom here. Um, even though they're not really inspecting it, we clean that up because it's hard to differentiate. But then what they're doing is they're going through the rest of the material here. And this is your spar area where we're looking for cracks in this basically another close to three eighths inch. Um, not as much in the main body of the spar, but together you have a webbing in there and it probably makes about again, three eighths of an inch thickness. And you can see on the edge here, here's, here's, here's your actual spar cap here. And then you have uh, the web, an, another webbing piece, which gives more support in there. Uh, and this constitutes uh, one half of the spar. And then as you see, you got an identical version without the webbing. Uh, uh, no, it still has webbing on it and in, inboard here on the uh, bottom or in our case, the top of the wing, which we're, we're looking upside down. So that's our, that's our uh, construction there. That's what the inspection is. It's looking at these bolt holes because if you do any Googling or if you look at some of these uh, pictures on, that they have, 
you'll see this fracture of the wing here. And they felt it initiated on the lower one, it ripped and then it tears everything else and cracks it off. And they felt they saw some metallurgical cracks in there that were there prior to the shearing force of it when it was ripped off. Um, they can kind of tell if it's a new, new fresh area or something old. So they, they looked under microscopes and things and said, you know what, we got, we got some cracking going here. And let me grab a piece of tape. I'll show you kind of where the separation. somewhere and let's just take a look and say all right what was left might have been something to that portion so on this side of the tape gone this is still left in the airplane here from this part of the tape over so that's kind of what they've been looking at for all these decades it seems like in these three incidences there was uh 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 cracks found on the, uh, the post uh, inspection on the airplanes. 1993, that airplane, there was a little crack and I can't remember if it was on the forward or aft, but they said it was in an area that the eddy current inspection that we're doing on the airplane wasn't deep enough. Uh, we were not going deep enough to see. Uh, so, that the eddy current inspection, so if you look in this new AD, there was 42 uh, questions asked from different responders in the, uh, the Civil Aeronautics Department at um, um, Australia. Um, they're really good. They're, they're very, very thorough. They're asked that question. They asked the, the FAA, they said, so would the 1993, if there was an inspection, would that have been detected? And the FAA says, well, no, they don't think that would have been caught because the penetration, it was further outside of those holes. So might not have originated in that hole or, uh, it, you know, so that one's kind of, you know, questionable on the 93 one. However, what we're going to do here is we're going to take a look, the FAA and the NTSB and Piper, we're going to look at these because it seems like everything's pointing to this area. And so that's why this AD comes out and it's widespread. Uh, we've had two archers and one arrow uh, with a wing separation. Um, and we got a whole list of them. We got, uh, if you look at the AD, it covers a whole bunch of them. Uh, let's see here. The range is huge. Uh, let's see our list here. AD. Um, so we got everything from, uh, they did not put the, the old 150s, 140s, 160s in or one, uh, 180s. No, they, uh, but they did all the um, uh, dash one wings. Then they drop into the 235, which is the Dakota, but it's the Hershey bar wing. They left the 236 dash one wing out of the mix. And then they put the arrows in, Hershey bar wing arrows, which are the 180s, the 200s, and then the dash one wings, the 201s, 201 turbos. Uh, they go into the Cherokee 6, the 260, the Lances, such as this one over here, the 300s, and they leave the 301s out. So there, there must be some structure differences. So they're, we're looking at these type of airplanes and basically what the inspection is, very simple, as you see with the box beam on, because we're doing that, um, now I will just, uh, we'll leave it off for this. By the way, these, we inspected these off. So with the box beam, you know, wing on, we're pushing those bolts back up into the spar. And then what we do is we take uh, on a drill, uh, take a nice emery cloth, to clean up that area. Cause you know, you got uh, paint, um, sometimes the canning from these bolts have been in a long time. The canning might slough off onto there and the eddy current can't really inspect with all that, uh, you know, it's gotta be cleaned up. So what we do is we'll, we'll on a drill, we'll take a, a scotch bright and spin it through there and clean it up uh, through the whole passage. And then they'll bring their eddy current machine. Um, and it's a, it's a hole inspection. And I will try to draw and explain eddy current just a little bit to show you what we're doing. Uh, 
not an expert on it. I don't think, you know, obviously we've studied it in AP school and different things, but I don't know the exact uh, theory on other than it's alternating current and we're sending, we're, we're looking at these wave signatures when we send current out into a metallic uh, object. So basically here's, let's just say that's their, their probe. And I'm, I'm being, uh, building it uh, big to scale. And I'm, in this probe, you basically have a sensor on either side of it. Now this fits in there, obviously. This is touching the wall here. This is touching the wall there. These sensors are about a 16th of an inch in, in thickness. They're pretty small. So what they do is they go up with that probe and they move it through. Here's our holes, right? This would be... This would be our box beam area. We're not really inspecting that, but we're going through. They're gonna take a look at it. Then we have the main spar material here, right there, and then that spar cap right there. And then, and uh, bolt hole's done at that point. And then we go up there from there. So what they're looking at is, they're bringing that tool through here and they're looking at sending a current out in waves, alternating current. And when it shows up a crack, any deformation will start showing up. They'll see a spike on it. So they're looking for any type of crack area in this. And, and what, what it does is as the current comes back, it will disrupt that pathway and it will show up on their screen as, as an anomaly. So um, that's what the inspection is. Now, the interesting thing on this inspection is it doesn't, why the 1993 is not going to, uh, lost my rag here, the 1993, uh, oh, I found it, I'm gonna need paper, okay. In 1993, why they say the inspection is not going to show up, so I'll go drill to uh, make this bigger. Here's, here's our, Here's our hole. Here's the uh, here's the uh, box beam area here. Here's our spar. Here's the little webbing right there. Okay. So when they put the probe through there, probe goes up, and you know we got the probe going through with its little detectors on the end right there and they're moving it up and down through the hole. Penetration, here's, here's the rest of the, you know, obviously the spar cap keeps on going this direction. What they're saying is in the 1993, that this crack was out here. This only is detecting about 30 thousandths, 32 thousandths of uh, penetration into here. So as this goes in, it's only sending the current and wrapping around coming back in about a 32 thousandths. You're looking for the bore of the of the bowl hole cracking and they said in 93 they think that crack was in there further and that's why that one wasn't would not have been detected uh, however that's one the other ones 1987 and the 2018 it would have detected if they saw that now the interesting thing is embry riddle's other arrow that they're flying or one of their other arrows they did find a crack Similar circumstances with uh, the 2008. They actually, when they did the inspection, they found a crack in this material there. So that's why, you know, now we actually have another airplane we found a crack. So what's the FAA and everybody doing? We're doing the least destructive to these airplanes. Because taking off wings and, and doing anything other than pulling a couple of bolts out is really hard on them. As you see, I had to really slide and fit. You imagine what it'd be like taking, taking these wings off that's a, and, and you got 18 bolts there plus the two there. You're stressing all those bolt holes. You're scraping them through. They're close tolerance. You try to push those bolts out carefully. Uh, when we do our inspection on the old, because we're putting new bolts in, uh, when we do our inspection, this bolt's coming through. You see, I can't even push it through. I have to really carefully get it. They're close tolerance. We actually clean up those threads and, 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 and take a take a, a, a file so they don't scrape as we're pushing the bolts back out because you don't want to scrape any of that area in there. Um, any, any scratch in metal can, can produce a crack. So you got to be really careful. So it, basically what, uh, what the FA is doing here, which is really a, a good idea, 
we're doing a cross section of a lot of airplanes. It's not that big of a deal to do these inspections. And we're, we're, we're basically looking to see if we find any problems, you know, uh, we don't know. I mean, if they're, if, you know, now our planes, we have 16 airplanes we inspect with a lot more takeoffs and landings than, than Embry Riddle. Um, you know, some of our customers that we've done, uh, these are some, a couple of them are pretty old airplanes um, as far as ours and uh, no cracks, no problems. So is it, you know, is it the high number of landings? I don't know. Uh, we only have four airplanes, if you count the one that other arrow that they found in every riddle. And so now we're doing a little investigation. We're doing a little field work. And it's not very painful. Um, it, it really wasn't a big deal. And, and we got 16 airplanes. We're going to send that information in. Everybody else is going to take a look at these affected ones. And the FAA is just kind of having a broad idea. Let's look at these bull holes because we think there's a problem there. Is it number of landings? Maybe. Um, is it metallurgy? Was there something specifically in those three airplanes that had an issue? We don't know yet. Um, but we're inspecting the bolt holes just to see if we find any cracking and we're doing it on high usage airplanes. Uh, meaning we're counting them if they're in the flight training situation. So um, I think that pretty much covers kind of how we're doing on the inspection. Now we look at who has to do it. How's the AD come out? Yeah, um, we have a formula, and this formula, first of all, uh, the AD specifies you know the, the models and serial number ranks of the airplane. You know, so we're gonna have some serial number and model number. Uh, so we'll just not worry about that. You look at the AD. Now, at the beginning of the AD, there's a, it's, a, it's kind of a two-part situation. You've got Total time in service. Okay. Does that mean you have to perform the, the actual inspection? No. Total time in service, 5,000 hours. Accumulated total time in service, you have to take a review of the logbooks. So 5,000 hours on the airplane, we review the logbooks. Uh, my airplane has 4,000 and roughly 200 hours. I don't have to review the logbooks. Obviously, I have, but uh, I don't have to. So at that point of the affected models that we're going to do the inspection on, we look at the total time in service, 5,000 hours. You got 5,000 hours or more, you're looking at it. Then what you do is they have a formula. And I'll just, let me just pull it out so I make sure I write it down properly. And the interesting thing on the formula, everybody looks at this AD and go, how did the FAA and everybody come up with this formula? If you look at the formula for service factor hours back in 1987, when this uh, service bulletin 886 or uh, 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 yeah, 886 came out, Piper put that, they, they came up with this, the service factor formula. So service factor formula, we're just gonna look at um, N, and that times 100 at here in parentheses. N is going to be number of hundred dollars. So basically, we're looking at is it commercially for hire? We're, we're thinking commercially for hire, Embry Riddle, commercially for hire. Um, I believe the first 1986 87 accident was commercially for hire and pipeline, and then. The other was a private use airplane, so the 93 is, is out of there, but we saw a fracture. Uh, so number of 100 hours, that is it, okay? Then we go over, we have a line here. Line is divided by 17. And then up here, we're gonna have T minus N times 100. So if you look at this, on any of the any different math formulas, we're going to see what we're going to be plugging in. Number of 100 hours times 100. We're going to subtract those out of there from the total time of the airframe, and then we're going to divide by 70. So if you look at how this works out, we'll do a sample here. 
pull, you pull the CU since they have it up here. The FA sample of it works pretty good. Next page. And you can just calculate in any of your samples that you want to do. So let's just say, um, let's say this is my airplane. It's never been for hire. One formula, and it's going to be zero times 100, which you know what that number is going to be, zero. And then we go plus uh, total time minus our number of hours. So we know that that's zero because this time it's just zero. So my total time by my airplane, let's just say it's 10,000 hours. Then divide that by 17. That number, yeah, calculator. Over here, ten thousand six hundred. Yeah, yeah, I mean, ten thousand six hundred on on. Uh, well, let's just use the FA one. They did twelve thousand one hundred uh, total time, zero hours. Twelve thousand one hundred divided by seventeen gives us a service factor, service factor that wing of seven hundred and eleven hours. So if you figure that out. Um, I'm going to be doing this AD sometime uh, around 80 some thousand hours, probably 80, almost 84,000, maybe a little bit more than that. Uh, I don't think I'll be flying the plane that by then. Uh, it's a lot of hours. So you see, it's, it's set up for non commercial use right now. Um, so now let's go back, check out Embry Riddle or a Thunderbird plane. See that. So if it's been flying all its life with 100 hours, number of 100 hours, let's go. Let's go. Uh, let's go 5,000 hours. 5,000 hours, how many, how many 100 hours would that be? Rusty? Hmm? Yeah. Gotcha. It's 50. 50. Okay. Okay. Times 100. Plus total time, we got, you know, that we all our life, we got 5K, so that there, uh, minus, uh, what's our number on end here? 5,000. Uh, correct? Yes. Yep. And let's see, so that would be. Um, uh, yeah, 5,000. By 17. So basically, 17, excuse me. Basically, what we end up having is our factory service equals service factor hours 5,000 hours. Yeah. Um, that means at 5,000 hours, we got to do the inspection. So it's one to one ratio on that. Where it gets confusing is when you when you have to take a look at airplanes. Say, um, we had I know one of our flying clubs. We 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 did it. We looked at all of them, and if you had to do a number of let's see if the FA has one in here for uh, a partial one. And they don't have one. They don't have one. But we could we could we could do our own. Let's just let's do this one. Let's go twenty five. 100 hours, okay. And what, give me a total time. Give, we'll make it high. What do you think? Huh? 13,000? Yeah, let's go 13,000. 13,000 total time. So plus this, divide by 17, service factor hours. All right, give me the math. So what's this? 2,500, right? So we're gonna subtract 2,500. Okay, what's that end up to be? Uh, uh, huh? 10,500. 10,500 divided by 17. 617. 617. So plus 2,500. Yep, plus 2,500. 617 plus our 2,500 gives us what? 30, 3,117. 3,117. So service factor is 3,117. So under the AD, don't have to do that inspection yet. And that's at 25 and a lot of hours. So on the AD, it's just a matter of keeping track of that. And then when this number reaches 5,000 hours as this uh, AD, now this is an interim AD, it might change, but right now 
As soon as we hit that number, we'll have to do the inspection, uh, but don't have to do the inspection. Um, and uh, some, some uh, Piper is only, if you look at the, there's a service bolt now, and I'll explain that. Some people decided that they're gonna do it anyways, and they were gonna do it early. Um, and this is a problem, and I always tell people, wait till an 80 comes out, because you don't necessarily get credit for it. Um, Piper came out with this service, mandatory service bulletin, 1345. Uh, 1345 specifies some of the arrows, doesn't specify any other airplane. Um, and it's Piper's mandatory service bulletin. Most of it is really close to how the AAD is written as far as the inspection, but it's not a one-to-one. -one. So a lot of people said, well, you know, I'm gonna do Piper's mandatory service bulletin on, on all my planes because I know when this AD comes out, I'm gonna, I'm gonna need to, you know, I, you know, I'm gonna do it. Well, guess what? You're not gonna get credit for it necessarily um, uh, because it's not specified. The AD didn't come out I and mean, the AD is not 1345 the service bulletin. So you could do the inspection, but you don't necessarily get credit. So a lot of operators said, I'm just gonna hedge this off. And it didn't turn out that way. I always told everybody, hold on, wait and see what happens. Don't start doing your whole fleet, you know, cause we've been talking that it's gonna be a huge range and they're probably gonna be something like this taking place. Well, guess what? Now you gotta, you did it, you spent all the money, you inspected it, everything's fine, but it's, it's like, you can't sign it off legally, you might not get credit. You know, the FAA is like, well, you're gonna have to apply for an alternative method of compliance because it's not following. This AD was not written in out yet. This didn't come out. Now we did ours before the AD was mandatory, but the reason we did, as soon as this came out in January 15, 21, then you have the legal documentation to start working on something. But doing it last year, a lot of people did it off of 1345, and that's not, that's a service bulletin. It wasn't an FAA legal document. So unfortunately, there's a, quite a few operators out there that are probably gonna have to do the inspect, pay for the inspection again. At least they know what the alternative is gonna be. So um, if it was fine the last time, I'm sure, I'm sure it's gonna be fine the second time, but they have to spend the money. So um, I always tell people, if there's a proposed AD is coming out, and this was, slowing the going with COVID and everything. It took, you know, a couple, three years for it to come out. We knew sometimes something was gonna come out. Uh, just relax, just wait. Let's see what's, what's gonna happen and then we'll go from there. So um, that in a nutshell is what's going on. Um, what time do we have? 46. 46, let's, uh, I think we're gonna open up the questions and answers right now because there's probably gonna be a lot of them here and people are gonna have some questions. And hopefully I covered everything as clearly as possible. Um, you got to see a wing here. You got to see what it looks like outside of an airplane. You saw the box beam spar uh, area um, and how it slides in and mates into um, your Piper. And this is an arrow, but it's the, 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 the warrior, uh, the uh, uh, Lance, all very similar. Very similar design. So, any so, questions? So, when you said you have to check the bolts, I was thinking something like a half inch around. No, no, these are these are. <laughs> but half, I guess it's because there's so many of them. Well, there's there's a lot. Yeah. yeah, you saw how tight this. It's a whole it's a whole assembly, a whole unit. I mean, Russ, you want to help me again here? So, I mean, now think about this is we're doing it the easy way. We got the chunk sitting out there. Now think about you got your airplane on a cradle. You're lifting up this wing and you're trying to slide it in this, this, this mating surface, get everything slid together and then you get it into place. And so then you're doing, you're doing it from the other and you're moving the wing. Yeah, you're moving the wing and then you got somebody in there trying to, and then line up the bolt holes and then start popping all the bolts into place from the inside of the spar out. Um, yeah, not to mention you got fuel lines, cables, everything else. That you have to take off. Taking a wing off is not fun. And there again, it's it's pulling these bolts and unmating the surface. It's not it's not a it's not a good it's not a good option to do. I mean, it's it's these were designed to be on and to stay on. So I really think in this case, the way I, I know a lot of people think that we're just uh, 
taking a pot of pasta that's al dente and throwing it against the wall and see if it's done and it sticks. Uh, but I think what the FAA has been doing here and, and their process from my not very engineering mind of checking these because that's where a lot of these cracks seem to be originating. We don't have a lot of information. We got four airplanes, three that crashed and one that we just found a crack in. Let's go inspect some of these bolt holes. It's very non-evasive, so to speak, to do it. So let's look. They, we got 16 that I did. So we got, uh, that's uh, 16 times four bolt holes uh, on these wings, you know? So we send this information in, they can start saying, all right, this is what's up. Plus all the information we got, you know, obviously more than five, uh, 5,000 hours of wing service time on these, you know, airplanes. So I think our, uh, our fleet's gonna be a good demographic and some of the customers that we've done so far is a good demographic to, to, uh, to say, all right, we don't have any cracks, you know? So is, how are we gonna, how am I gonna stop a fourth wing falling off? What, what, how, do we, how do we see this? You know, what's causing? Is it uh, our operation is gonna be the same as uh, Embry-Riddle? Why, why are ours fine? You know, is there something metallurgically? Is there something about the serial number of the airplane? You know, I, I don't know. Is there something about what if we know that that gentleman in 1993 ripped his wing off, but there happened to be a crack? Maybe he had gotten himself into some situations before and overstressed that wing to such a point that it caused the crack. I don't know. I mean, he got himself in a, a VFR pilot in an IMC. He would have ripped that wing off without the crack and he ripped his wing off. Well, what if he overstressed it and we don't know? Maybe the other two airplanes were overstressed at some time. Um, I can use a, for instance, of, of, of um, flight, uh, uh, my aviation partner uh, owned Flight School Hawaii. He had his uh, restart 172s and there, you know, somebody was going to rent it, came back, uh, person did negative G's, the chalks were actually hanging out of the back window. So you think, you know, three feet, maybe that acceleration to actually get a pair of chalks to be popped out of there. That's beyond the design characteristics of the airplane. It's not supposed to do that. So now that gets reported because it came back broken, but how many times do airplanes go out that people rent it or something happened and it's, it's over the stress limits of the plane. We don't know. Um, is that, you know, or, you know, mm -hmm. is it something else? But right now let's poke at it a little bit. Very minimal. we got a lot of bolt holes that, that will get checked and we'll see how the numbers come out. And I think that's the best thing is just the, I mean, it's, it's very, the inspection right now is looking at those bolt holes because that's kind of the idea. We think it's coming from the bolt holes. Um, why it's coming from the bolt holes, we don't know yet, but let's just take a look at what the airplanes, how they're used and check those bolt holes. Very non-invasive and it's easy to do, so. Some questions? Yeah, so um, Paul, first one, for the AD inspection, are you taking the two out of the bottom, the two inside of the bottom and the top or nope. just the bottom? Just the bottom spark cap. Only, a, only bottom spark caps have failed, which obviously is stress low, you know, as you know, it's always positive. You know, now I, I, I was thinking something else. They say takeoffs and landings. So, uh, you know, that operation or low level flight of always stressing an airplane. And I don't know, but it seems to me that these wings are always under one G load. Sitting right there, they're under one G load because those bolts and this spar cap, because the landing gear are there, are holding the weight of the airplane up. But, you know, um, you know, in the NTSB report, they're saying low level flying, maybe it's flaps, maybe there's some, something else going on there, or the fact that, I don't know, I mean, I know Fred, you land so well that, I mean, you don't even know you're landing, so that puts no stress. It has more stress to sit in stationary, doesn't it? Oh, of course. <laughs> yeah. every, every time. <laughs> every time, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Me too, you know, it's like all my <laughs> However, my landings aren't under, under investigation because uh, I'm a, uh, I'm a uh, uh, not, not for hire, it's my personal airplane. So that's the other thing. Is it gonna open up a little bit more to 
uh, not just looking at at uh, uh, hundred hour airplanes. I mean, I look at it. You know, I know my airplane had been landed hard because they stretched landing gear bolts before somebody that previous owner. I go in there and all the landing gear bolts are stretched. I had to replace them. So you know there was a hard landing at some point there. Um, so, but we just have to see. We'll have to see what happens on this. Uh, you know, when they get gathering information, this is an interim AD. It's going to get worse, get better, or stay the same. We don't know. I mean, but I'm sure it's going to be adjusted somewhere. They even the FA is because they're 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 like they said we're kind of we're kind of probing. We're probing, literally. Eddie Eddie current probing. We're probing those bolt holes to see if we find anything and try to get some type of consistency with how the airplane was used of what's going on, so. Thomas has a question. His airplane has 3,600 hours total time in service, but one wing was replaced with a serviceable wing with unknown history. I assume I need to any current inspect the one wing. Should yes. I do both as well? Might as well, might as well, just, just for his peace of mind, yes. Yeah, if you, time and service wing, I didn't, uh, thanks for bringing that up, Thomas. I did not. If you don't know where your wing came from and it's been replaced, uh, you're going to have to assume that you're at the 5,000 uh, uh, hour service factor limit. You can't prove that. Um, yeah. And that's that's an interesting one because in the AD, I was just trying to think. It says time and service on the airframe, but you have to. Technically, that's something that they'll probably have to clarify in the AD. There isn't anything that I saw in the AD that specifies that he'd have to do that uh, uh, inspection on his log books. But since he knows that something is done, it would be a good idea. But yeah, I mean, in general, I don't think I've read that AD over very carefully. I think that might be kind of missing in there. So that's a good one, Thomas. That's a really good one. Um, and the, AD, uh, the FA might have to, uh, that'll, that'll be a revision on the AD once we, we get some things going on there. Yeah. Jim uh, or he asks, so if I understand it right, if my plane is not used for commercial training, I would need to do an inspection at 85,000 total hours. That sounds about right. <laughs> yep, yep. Technically, the mandatory service bulletin, but it's not required as far as, you know, service bulletins, even though they're mandatory, are not, um, um, what's the word I'm thinking for? Um, well, requ uh, required. Re yeah. Required legally by, a, a, you know, airworthiness direct zone. Now, uh, Piper says, what was it, 62,900 hours? So he'd have to do it then, really. <laughs> and he should do it then under this Piper service bulletin. So I'm uh, sorry I knocked down a few few thousand hours on you. <laughs> so you're going to have to wait till 62,900. So. David asks, does corrosion seem to have any part in the crack? They have not talked about anything in corrosion. They didn't see anything in there, but obviously, you know, you'd be concerned about corrosion in any area of this. Um, um, and there is some, uh, like, there was an AD that came out for the Hershey bar things on quite a few models. Now you can see we can we can look inside, pull these panels off, look inside the spar area underneath these pan uh, these areas here, um, and see in there on the Hershey bar wing. If you look, and I, I've been doing a few of these, uh, and that is. Uh, obviously, this is sheeted over, but there's no there's no panels in this area to get in there and see. And it's really tough with the boroscope. So the easiest thing what Piper says is on the back aft section, which would be actually here on those Hershey bar wings, we're cutting in a oval access panel so we can get in there and look at surface corrosion, visually take a look at it. There's some alternative methods of compliance where people are going through with boroscopes, but you know what? It's it's simple, easy to put those access covers in. Just put them in there and then you can you can spray anti-corrosion stuff. You can you can look through and, and through as far to see this side, but you really need in that back half to put those access panels in. But that is because we're concerned, you know, especially on aging airplanes, if they didn't have a good, a good um, uh, anti-corrosion agent sprayed onto it, we don't want to see corrosion. I don't want to see any slop in the metal on something. I don't care if it's here or here. That's all supporting your wing. <laughs> so, Bill has a Cherokee 6 with 3,500 hours, had a bad landing in 1980 that damaged the left wing and a hard landing in 93 that damaged the nose wheel. Would you recommend to do an 
spectrum anyway. Absolutely. Absolutely. I would say that would be in the criteria uh, that that possibly would be in the criteria of either B uh, of, uh, what was that? Uh, e e6, e66. So, uh, uh, extreme data, I mean, and you have to take a look. To have them take a look at service bulletin 886. But if we're in class B, uh, severe usage, extreme usage or damage history, 50 hours within time in service. And then every 1600 hours in time. So you got to start taking a look at this and say, hey, uh, uh, what happened there? How bad was it? And it's, you know, so if it's a class B in a group one airplane, uh, 3,700 hours, they want you to take a look at it. So that's ones where you're low level flying, different things like that, heavy, you know, the aerial guys doing the DNR, looking at gear down there and flying low with the flaps down. Um, and then I don't, I, I didn't read what uh, extreme usage or class damage history, but uh, Bill might uh, fill in, uh, fit into uh, damage history. Now, what is this? Uh, uh, Cherokee 6? Yep. Yep. Cherokee 6 is on that 886, so um, he should do it anyways. Uh, so, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Better be safe than, you know, if you know you got some, if somebody really calls it in, better be safe. It's not that expensive to do. It really isn't. Um, uh, if you, depending on the uh, uh, non destructive testing companies, uh, they give you a break if a few people get together, but you're going to be anywhere from $500 to $700 for a, one trip out. And then as far as the mechanics, the pop the bolts, the bolts are, bolts are relatively expensive. Launch those nuts, that's nothing. And then the time to pop it out, clean it up, you know, say, we got two hours. And then the paperwork, maybe a little bit more. So I mean, it's, it's not a well under $1,000 bill. I mean, I understand the aviation. I, I know if I had you know to get on my airplane thousand dollar bill, uh, but still, I mean, when you think about your life uh, and, and your peace of mind, um, I think it's a small amount. A small amount. Of uh, Thomas is based out of Bristol. Uh, he's asking if we have open hands in the inspection team. Uh, yes, we do. We do have the ability to do it. Uh, and I can, and it, it depends on the non destructive testing guys, I have to say. So we can just call call up and, and uh, set something up with us. Carl would like to know how much you expect to spend to fly with the AD inspection, not including the law the inspection. Well, there again, like I said, it depends on the number of when we did our, uh, our fleet, we got a discount because we had. Uh, at least four airplanes in. Uh, so the non destructive testing guys are going to get their money out of you one way or another. If they have to do a single trip charge, they're going to charge more per, per unit. So, like I said, uh, I don't remember what their, their amount is, but it could be. I would say the bill could be closer to $1,000 if there's only one airplane at a time going. Depending on the non destructive testing guys. Um, Jay Gray would like to know if the failures have all been on the same side. Uh, so 86, 87 was the left. I don't know. I, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, 87 was left. I don't know. Can't answer that one. We'd have to take a look at the NTSB reports and see they haven't specified. I just know that 
they called out the left wing on uh, 87. Lower left wing, uh, seven. What's that? Every riddle, and so then 1993, we'd have to see what that is. They don't, they don't call it up. So <laughs> it's kind of interesting, isn't it? I don't know if it means anything. Um, you know, I, I took a, a, a statistics course at, at college, and, and one of the things they brought up was correlations on things and relationships. And one of the things the guy, uh, the, the instructor said was, okay, so you got, you got sales of ice cream and drownings. Oh, must be related. Higher the sales of ice cream, the higher the amount of drownings. So there's gotta be something really connecting the two together. It must be ice cream, must make you drown, right? You could come to that conclusion. He said, no, sales of ice cream means it's a hot, warm day and everybody's at the lake. So we sell more ice cream when people are in the water swimming, you know? So there's a relationship. So I don't know, left wing, maybe, maybe, I think we never know, but you know, you can, you know, these stats people can skew anything they want, you know, um, sell more ice cream, you might drown. <laughs> so uh, to confirm, you do have to replace the bolts. Yes, yes, replace the bolts. All hardware. Well, they, I, I replace all the hardware. Big, big deal. Yeah. That's all I got. Okay. Okay. That's our hour. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, Thank you guys. very much for uh, coming today, everybody. And the uh, next uh, seminar we have here from Thunderbird will be March 13th. And that'll be on uh, putting air aircraft information into foreflight and then doing the VFR and IFR flight planning. And the uh, next Maintenance one is going to be on. Um, I always have to put him on a spot because he has to make the spot. make the decision right now, so we know what's right down. Yes. Okay. <laughs> we are going to do um, bringing your airplane out of cobwebs because it's going to start being spring. There you go. That's an excellent idea. So thank you everybody for everybody for coming this afternoon, and we'll see you later.